It's Cardcast with Mike and Lens, the show about everything sports cards, autographs, and memorabilia. I'm Len Plus Z, and I'm here with my friend and co-host Mike D. Well, actually, we have a special guest today uh, in studio, first time ever on CardCast. We're going to get a hold of Mike in a little bit. It is Valentine's Day. We're just a mess with our scheduling and stuff like that, but uh, we're happy that you're hanging out, and we have a we have a good show for you. So, uh, But sitting to my right, six feet apart, uh, I have my good friend and hobby enthusiast and card collector, Steve Owens. So please welcome Steve Owens to the show. So, Steve, you came over, you brought a box of, of stuff. Uh, you, as far as, t- tell the listeners what you like to collect. I, I usually like to collect the, the vintage, uh, <clears throat> 50s and 60s, some of the home run kings, Mantle, Aaron, Mays, Clemente, some of the staples. Um, I also trickle into the 70s and 80s and the guys that I collected growing up. So, Schmidt, Murphy, Yount, Molitor, any of that stuff that I was collecting with my brother a lot in the 80s. I still <clears throat> dabble in that as well. Now, as far as the now, you you just don't collect anything. I mean, you look for your particular. So, explain how particular you are. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I mainly the the eye the eye appeal. You know, there's some centering. There's, uh, you know, the color how the how the card pops. But I mean, growing up, it was mainly just just the sharp corners. And now it's kind of as you're going to some of these bigger shows and you see like the Big collectors are going for the centering and this and that. So I, I'm kind of fine tuning a lot of what I'm collecting and upgrading from sixes to sevens, from sevens to eights, and stuff like that. And so I bet you that's uh, a little expensive these days, huh? It's it's getting a bit pricey. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why I've gone to some of the raw, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> raw purchases. Um, you know, I I know. It, so just to kind of, I've known Steve for a long time, and and I, you know, he'll over the years he's shared with me at times what he has. Uh, collected what he has purchased, what he has paid for stuff, and then w- recently, um, you know, we actually were supposed to have our my my other friend uh, Tom Carlack on the show. Uh, he's out in Kansas City. We'll get him on. Um, just a little bit of a scheduling conflict, and I got super busy this week, but we'll get him on. Um, he found, you know, he bought packs from ninety six, ninety seven, and pulled a bunch of Kobe stuff. And he's sitting on. We estimated probably sitting on like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars worth of stuff. And some of the stuff that you would purchase, you know, just in the past, you know, 10, 15 years has mm-hmm. gone from like a hundred to two grand. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, you know, so you came over and you brought over, uh, you, know, you had some basketball stuff. Like what, what were some of the basketball cards that you had? Uh, the LeBron James, uh, <clears throat> 2003 tops PSA 10. And then I had the, uh, Kevin Durant rookie 2007 PSA 10. And what in what are those currently trading at right now or selling for? Well, are selling for, I believe the LeBron is up around 10k, I believe, and the Durant's are probably about around around two. Uh, I yeah, I mean my my mind when I initially you know had seen what some basketball prices of of those key rookies were selling for, like Kobe Bryant ninety six tops and two thousand three LeBron over the past year. Every time it got to like a thousand or two thousand or whatever, I'm just like my jaw would just drop further and further. That sure. there's no further my jaw can drop except <laughs> for the fact when I hear, you know, a tops LeBron James is ten grand. Like that's insane. I almost could not believe when it got to a thousand. And then it was like yeah. it's five thousand and now it's so so what are you doing with those cards <laughs> <laughs> all right now see this no but this is this is important because there are a lot of people out there that have made like you know you're 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 really a collect you're not a dealer you're not a flipper correct you know you are a true you're you're a collector so um you will sell off some of your doubles and things that as you upgrade and go along yeah. and that as you should because i mean i he can't hold on to everything but Oh, well, you can, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, it's just the, I think the key question here is what I'm trying to get at is when do you sell, well, that's, you know, like, well, like please, cause me, you know me and I, and I, I'm, I'm a dealer and I will buy things and hold them to a certain point. But I, you know, I pretty much am always buying behind the market and I'm always mm-hmm. selling to the market. I've never had the actual benefit of going to a show, paying now you're usually paying close to retail on all this stuff, but then actually enjoying the potential benefits, and I'm talking about you, of actually selling stuff and making a killing because you because you held. Sure. But when do you sell? 
Well, that's the that's the big question. But <clears throat> I mean, I usually it's the the old adage that you you buy what you like, mm -hmm. you know. And I enjoy the cards that I collect, but it kind of yeah, it gets to a certain point where look, I, the LeBron and let's say the, the the Kobe and the Durant. I've always been more of a, a baseball and football collector. The basketball I didn't buy as much, but I don't think many people did. Anyways, that's why right. now you're seeing this big. It's been undervalued for years, but. It's a really good point that, that basketball has been undervalued for mm -hmm. years. So it, they just, you know, going back to just the production and the, in the missed years from the eighties and you know, what's out there. And now being that basketball, I feel is, you know, there's only so much of it to, to, to get. I mean, it, even in 2010, when Steph Curry came out, they short printed the runs and with there being such a high demand with that many collectors globally, and investors globally going after basketball right now, there's not enough. There's no. not enough of that. And that's why you're seeing those, those sure, top cards going. It's a global going. market because yeah. basketball is this global yeah. sport, but certainly for the last 30 years. Right, right. Um, a lot of that had to do with David Stern. Check out one of our uh, mm -hmm. first podcasts when we uh, you know gave a tribute to David Stern and I believe Don Larson. Uh, and some of the things that he did was amazing. Uh, introducing... Uh, um, you know, American basketball and sending tapes over to China back in 1987 mm -hmm. so that they can, you know, they can watch and, 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 and actually air the games themselves. So uh, kudos to, to David Stern. Um, so, so, but you still haven't answered my question. You say you don't know, <laughs> you don't know. I mean, when, when is enough enough? I mean, you're not, I don't look at you as a greedy person. You're not like greedy, you know, but, no. but I mean, at some point, point i mean you, you got to look at it and say like i mean do you want a maserati do you want do you want to do you want to just buy a house outright like because you because you didn't only do this in this you did this with like comic books like sure. you, yeah tell us about your what was the hulk the, the, or your number ones like just run through your top number ones and, and tell me what you paid for them and 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 where they're at right now gee i think that was uh <clears throat> when all well, the marvel movies came back out was the time i got back into i graduated college and got back into collecting so <clears throat> I started getting on the, the Hulk one and the Amazing Spider-Man number one, Avengers one, uh, Iron Man number one, that sort of thing, Captain America, anything that came out in the 60s that was either a first appearance or a number one. But now I bought that Incredible Hulk, I think for $1,600 <clears throat> in 2006. And it was a 14, I think $1,450 in the price guide. So I actually had to call my friends, like, should I overpay for this? He said, it's a Hulk one, buy it. Right. And now that's up to in excess of 10 K as well. Is it, well, is it still, because it was a couple years ago, it was 10 K. I mean, did it go, did it go higher? It's, is it like 15 now? It's or? a bit, I think there's, it's been a, uh, yeah, it's a bit higher than that. I, I think I've seen like sort of guide value or, uh, about 13 and a half. There's, there's few, I think a lot of people are holding on to them as well. There's to begin with, there's not a lot out there. And I think people, when they saw the big rise, there's some of them are, are holding on to those. Yeah. And so I haven't seen many. On, online, nor have I really looked. Like, that's for well, I'm not. In the, you're not, not. Well, you're not in the market to sell either. Right. And you're not going to. You're not going to buy another one, especially not at no, that price. No. So. And the, the Fantastic Four was the same one. Fantastic Four yeah. number one. That's probably one of the most I, I paid for the time was about three thousand dollars. Man, I cannot believe I'm spending three thousand dollars on the Fantastic Four. But now that's about five x. That's about fifteen wow. grand right now. But you just don't see many traded, so I don't really know. Yeah. I'm waiting to kind of see that pop up in the market again. And yeah. See what it actually. Goes I just I, I view I view your collection again. I mean, you've you've we've talked about your collection in, in in length and in depth a lot, and I just look at it as like, I mean, you bought high dollar scratch off tickets, and you talk about the multipliers. I mean, I just feel like that you just hit like over and over and again. It's like, you know, I, I hope that this whole you know, boom in the, in just in the whole collectibles hobby keeps going. Um, you know, there's people that are saying, you know, they're, they're, they want to, they, they feel like they, they have to get out there and say they, you know, they want to short the market almost and, and say like, it's going to crash. And I'll be the, I'm the first one to tell you it's going to crash and mm -hmm. this and that. And, um, I think things will, will settle down when, when, you know, everybody gets their vaccines and, and sure. people are going, they're actually can spend money on other things like vacations and things like that because, you know, everybody's been cooped up in their house forever. Mm -hmm. But I also think that because of this whole run of, you know, being stuck indoors and then the Jordan documentary and the unfortunate passing of Kobe, Pat, you know, passing away, um, the, all those things just, just, added up to like this explosive thing and, and brought a lot of eyes to the hobby that just haven't been there. Um, especially in the past 10, you know, 10, 11 years. So. Right. And that, that's going back to your question. That's sort of like, well now 
you almost hit it while it's hot for some things. Because right. if I sell my Hulk one now, I'm not going to, the market stays the same. I'm not going to buy my way back into it. So if I want to Hulk one of my collection, I sort of, I need to hold on to it because yeah. I, I cannot see myself spending that kind of money yeah. on any one thing nowadays. So if I get rid of that, uh, that Hulk or any of the mantle cards or something like that, I don't so, know if I can read, I can't, but certainly not in that grade. <laughs> yeah. So I got a question for you. So, so, so when do you sell? <laughs> when, when, when do you sell? We're trying to get to that point. When do you sell? So, sure. um, I, you know, that good luck. I don't, <laughs> I don't think we're going to get that out of you. So, True. but no, but you know what? That, that is, that is the definition of the true collector. I will say this. I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. Can't take it with you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so when we all go for that final dirt nap, you might be surprised what goes with me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. So apparently you got some connections that nobody else has. So, um, <laughs> anyways, well, stuff like the modern basketball and the LeBron and, and is not as it's, sentimental as let's say something I collected as a kid yeah. the, the Hulk one and whatnot. So sort yeah. of that thing goes up in value to a place that I think it cannot go any further. I think I would be prepared to sell that. Gotcha. So we're just going to, uh, we're going to take a quick pause and we are going to get Mike on the phone. Uh, it is again, it's Valentine's day. So happy Valentine's day, Steve. You too. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to, <laughs> yes, it is. It's Len Plus E, and we are we're live, sort of. Well, we're we're pre recording, but what? Huh? that's it. So, and we have we have my good buddy Steve Owen here, who I don't think you actually officially met from the shows, but I know, I'm sure you guys have uh, you know bumped into each other and maybe not realized it or whatever. But uh, we were just uh, talking about s s he brought over a LeBron James tops PSA ten, some Kevin Durant. Uh -huh tops PSA 10s and we were just talking about the price increase of those just I mean the, the 10 LeBron is like 10 grand now it's it's amazing it's amazing I, I don't know if people are like I don't know if this is legit I'd like to think it is but I don't know I feel like there's just people possibly pumping this stuff up to the point of of no return it's, it's amazing I, who are the people buying this stuff <laughs> it, I mean my understanding is there's a lot of investors out there now Wall Street types that are looking to buy this kind of stuff but I, I don't know. I, I guess it's true. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you, you are correct. I mean, I guess the only way to find out is to sell one yourself. So I, I was just asking Steve, I was like, when do you sell? And he, we just, man, we went the whole roundabout <laughs> way of, of basically he's not selling, but, but, uh, but maybe, I don't know. So, um, anyways, yeah, that's how I felt, uh, 1986 about Jose Canseco's Donner's card. Exactly. Which I sold it back then. <laughs> right, right. Oh, and even that card is like getting like it's like it's not getting back oh, to one hundred and fifty dollars, but yeah, no, it's it's crazy. It's it's just it's a whole new world. Steve brought over a uh, what was it a GAI nine or 10? nine point five nine point five. So it's in an older holder. It does it does not look trimmed. It doesn't look like it was messed with at all. It's really it's, it's actually really really nice. It's a brilliant example of the eighty six dollars rated rookie Canseco. Oh, awesome. So uh, anyway, so Mike, I know you got limited time here. It's uh, Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day to you, bud. Oh, happy Valentine's Day to you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so by the way, did was it did you was it last night that you pulled out the Griffey auto or the day before or uh, a couple of nights ago, maybe what's ago. today? Today is Sunday, maybe Friday night, Thursday okay. or Friday night. Gotcha. Yeah. So definitely check out uh, opening day, even just for the entertainment value. I mean, go, go on there, get notified when he goes on. Um, it doesn't cost anything to participate, but you just you could just go on there and see him break some amazing stuff. And there's a lot of great hits that have been coming out. The Hulk Hogan, Dennis Robin, dual sign, you know, pack pulled card, and just all all sorts of good stuff coming out of there. And you have a big variety of of uh, of uh, things to open, going from you know early 80s to 70s wax packs to um something that gets guaranteed autographs and game you stuff all the time so oh thank you for the plug buddy oh you got it man you got it so anyways we're here to talk about one of the greatest players of all time uh in baseball mr henry lewis aaron or hank aaron the hammer uh you know passed away a couple weeks ago on january 22nd 2021 20, uh, and i gotta tell you, i was even though he was 80 six years old, you know, it, it definitely was a sad day, you know, because we lost an icon. I got to tell you, I, you know, it, it's funny because he, I, I felt like even though he was great and he was well-respected, he didn't get the props 
he honestly deserved. Because you think about it, you hear Willie Mickey and the Duke. You hear Ted Williams. Hank Aaron is like in that next rung. You hear Sandy Koufax. I feel like Aaron didn't get the due that he was deserved, uh, at least from collectors. In I mean, listen, everybody collected, you know, who they, who they collected. But Hank Aaron, you know, yeah, nobody who said, ah, I'm collecting a Hank Aaron card from every year. No one did that. And I feel like, unfortunately, his death brought about maybe a new a new uh, resurgence in his stuff. At least I, I hope so. Well, no, it, I feel like his stuff was valued. It, it absolutely did. And, um, you know, it, I think the thing that stuck out to me the most was, and it's sad that, you know, it's sad that it took his passing f- for people to come out and say this. And I mean, people had said it before, but I mean, it was really made, they made it known like the collectors, the fans, they all spoke and everybody was putting out, you know, the re- the true home run King, you know, had passed. And, and when I saw that over and over and over again, I was like, I was kind of like, what's Barry Bonds thinking <laughs> right now? Cause you know, I mean, you know, he's, it, you know, rumors had it that he, you know, he thinks a little highly of himself. And, um, you know, I don't know. I'm pretty sure he, I mean, listen, with all that being said, I mean, Barry Bonds, I know he was like close to Aaron for a while. And, you know, because he has that 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 family in, in baseball and, you know, they played against his father and, and this and that. So he's been around those guys. And Willie Mays, I think, is his godfather um, to, you know, to Barry Bonds. So uh, I'm sure... You know, he he was saddened by the death, but then also, you know, he's he, he I don't think Bonds is like you know, he, he did what he did because he felt like he had approved to everybody that he can do it, I guess, with performance enhancing drugs or, or whatever, allegedly. <laughs> but uh but he you know, he hasn't said much about anything, or I haven't seen anything, you know, on, on him saying anything. No, I haven't seen anything from I haven't seen anything from Bonds in a very long time, to be honest with you. He's yeah. just keeping quiet. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he was a batting. Is he still batting coach for the, for the Marlins? He's still doing that. I, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. All right. All right. Well, we'll figure that. <laughs> we'll figure that out after. So, it's a couple things that just. I mean, first of all, his, you know, his statistics are just insane. I mean, you know, you talk about being consistent for as, as many years as he was. Um, I mean, he was a 25 time all-star, you know, he was a, he was a world series champion in 1957. Um, he carried a career average of, you know, 305, 30, uh, 3,771 hits, 755 home runs, almost just under 2,300, uh, 2,300 runs batted in. And I mean, just, he just has a ton of just awards, you know, four-time home run, uh, NL home run leader, two-time NL batting champion, three-time gold glove award. It, but in, and it's funny because I think he did all that without ever hitting, you know, 50 home runs in a season. So, I mean, he was just, just extremely, extremely consistent. consistent. Yeah. that's definitely. And, and he really didn't get hurt. But one of the things, and, you know, people talk about, and when I was doing my research for Aaron, I noticed uh, people talk about unbreakable records. And, you know, obviously something like Cy Young. I always say, if someone asks me, what's the most unbreakable record? 511 wins. Never going to be touched, obviously. Um, but a lot of people say, oh, Joe DiMaggio's hitting streak. That could be touched. But how about 25 All-Star games? Now, keep in mind, there were, I think, three or four years where there were two All-Star games in a season in the 60s. And he made all of them. But still, 25. Guys don't play 25 years anymore. Right. And he only didn't make the All-Star game his rookie year. And then his last year, because he only played half a season. Other than that, every single year he was in the All Star game, and I think three years twice. But that'll never twenty five. That'll never be touched again. Right, and and you know the other thing too is the the amount of years that he's played. You know, I'm not saying that that's not going to be touched, but you know, if you look at again, we were talking about consistency. If you look at the the current baseball player today, I mean, everybody's eyeing Mike Mike Trout. His numbers are just off the charts, but he still had he's he's like you know what halfway through with his career if he chooses to play 20 years so i mean you know it it just goes to show you that like i mean and and again you know with with what we went through in the 90s and and guys landing monster contracts at the age of 36 for five years thinking that they're going to play to 41 and they're popping off 40 to 50 to 60 home runs a year i mean that was just insane we're not going to see you know if, if if the mlb is clean of all that the body is good. You know, it's going to break down, you know, it's going to break down, you know, well, so I, Tom Brady. Well, you know, but also, well, with difference between Tom Brady, it, you know, is, 
you know, he's not playing football in the eighties, you know? No, so, right. so, I mean, there is, there, there is a, 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 a different reason besides his own, you listen, he doesn't put anything bad in his body. He is religious, um, with that. <clears throat> and, uh, and what he's done is, has been remarkable, but he's also not getting hit. Like, you know, no like, LT coming off the corner. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, but yeah, I don't see, I don't see players, today even coming close for for a lot of reasons so some of these records are going to just they're going to hold for a long time unless if things change and and you know pitchers are allowed to throw more than 70 in a you know in a game and i don't know yeah it's a totally different world but we're we're like we're in awe of the fact that someone like him like you think about all these guys who go on the disabled list the yankees had like 40 guys on the disabled list last year hank aaron consistent 20 something 22 23 to whatever years Never on the, like he might have been on the disabled list, but he played every single year. He was a beast every single year. Look at a guy we were ogling um, Albert Pujols in two thousand one. Right. Oh, this guy's amazing. He's going to be uh, the next home run leader. Falls off the you know he goes to Los Angeles and he falls off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Did, you know Hank Aaron didn't fall off. He was right. he was a consistent player his whole career. That you you just don't see anymore. Right. Yeah, even even Griffey. I mean, you know, with going from the Reds yeah. to the White, he, his body broke down. He got hurt. And he still hit over six hundred yeah. home runs. And yeah, yeah but Griffey was. I, I felt like Griffey was always hurt. Unfortunately. Yeah. But, well, he, uh, yeah, he he bet, well he banged himself up in the nineties, just crashing the walls. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I mean, he you know, and he he went all out. I mean, it was it was pretty pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. to see. He was he was a, a lover of the game, and you saw it in every every at bat, every swing, every you know fly ball he caught that's the type of guy he was and you, you appreciated him for it his body didn't appreciate him that much for it and that's what ended up eventually costing him you know probably 50 to 100 home runs yeah i mean so we were talking about the like you know the, the like you were saying putting together like you know runs of tops i mean i think people were starting to do that a little bit i would say probably going back to 2015 you saw it really i, I think that's when i first kind of started seeing people talking about like collecting the rainbow you know one of each you know the main uh, you know, card, not even, you know, leaders cards or anything like that. And, you know, we did see that with Aaron and any, uh, any particular Hank Aaron cards that, uh, that you like, Mike, that, that stick out in your mind? Uh, well, obviously I, I'm okay. So I'm a big fan. I put together the 1955 Bowman set. So I have an absolutely a huge appreciation for that set. And especially that Aaron card, that was one of the, you know, there's maybe, I wouldn't say, I don't know, four or five, six cards that are really, really tough to get in that set because they're just so expensive. They're iconic players, the mantle, the maze, and obviously the, the Hank Aaron. And then some of the high number, even the high number umpires are tough to get. Yeah. But the, the Hank Aaron, I just, I love the card. It's just, you know, I, I love the border. I love the, you know, the way he looks in it. It's just, I, that, that's the card to me. If I'm thinking of Hank Aaron, and I know people, everybody's going to have a different response, but me, I'm partial to that 55 Bowman set. So I'd go with uh, the 55 Bowman. But what, what about you? Well, uh, well, we'll pat, we'll pat. We'll, let's not be rude. We'll pass that off to Steve <laughs> first. So, Steve, what are you? Uh, w- you know, what do you? What's your favorite Hank Aaron card? Favorite card, probably. <clears throat> I do like the fifty-five and fifty-six sets in general, and obviously that's an early Hank uh, card to get. And uh, so I always like those, and I'm always an, an MVP collector as well. So I like the fifty-seven, especially since it's it is reversed. Yes, it was never corrected. So I did upgrade that last year before all of his yeah. cards exploded. Um, I mean, the rookie itself, I, I bought at one of my first nationals that I went to with my brother. So <clears throat> the story was that with that was that the, I think the card I, I bought it in it was a, a four, and I think the retail about the time was about a thousand dollars, and the guy had it for twelve hundred. But it was really, really, really nice, and <laughs> I remember going back to it after day one, day two, day three. And finally, the, the last day, I went there, and my brother said, "Look." If it were me, I probably wouldn't buy it. But I know if you leave without it, you're gonna regret it. And I bought it for the, the twelve hundred bucks, and now that card is yeah, th- yeah uh, thousands it. more. So it always has that little feel you, to yeah. it too. <laughs> the attached uh, scratch off ticket attached, multiplier, yeah. Yes, because I only brought that much kind of money. I think I actually yeah. cashed in a, a savings bond that I had as a kid from that wow. someone gave me. But she was a big sports fan, so I said if I go there, I have to get an iconic card that I'm never gonna sell. And that's a cool story in itself. Do you remember what year that was? Was that 2013? I, I think that was uh, 2000. 
15. 15, okay. I, I think. Was yeah. that the first national you went to? Or? I think it was 2014 was the first national okay, gotcha. I went to. And this was the, the second one, I think, out in Chicago. In oh, how we missed the national, huh, yes. Mike? <laughs> in the East Coast national and shows in general. Um, but I would say my, you know, my, I have to, I like the, um, they're, they're the non, you know, the non base cards of the sets. I love the 60 and 61 sporting news, all-star cards, you know, just really clean. Um, you know, they show his face. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the 60 is, he has got more of a, you know, a torso shot, but, uh, I really enjoy, I mean, I like all of it. I mean, anytime I go out and buy a collection, there's Hank Aaron's and I mean, I'm, I'm excited if, if it's a 69, if it's a 75, whatever, it doesn't matter. I like the sideways cards too. It's yeah. 56, 60. Yeah. Both of those have the, uh, their sideways and, and, and up and down the sporting news ones. But, um, but that was pretty cool. So anyways, we have a couple minutes left and, uh, Mike, do you know what time it is? Is it the uh, flux capacitor time? I believe so. Didn't you just pick up uh, an actual DeLorean? Does that work? Can we jump in that? I, I couldn't jump in. I, I tried, but I ended up breaking it by we're sitting on it. We're gonna, so, uh, we're gonna have to incorporate. I went back in time and fixed it and didn't sit on it the next time. So but here, yes, I did. here's what we're gonna have to do. We're gonna have to incorporate "Honey, I Shrunk the Kids" and "Back to the Future" <laughs> in the same segment, so we could fit in your DeLorean. That is signed by who? Who's it signed by? Uh, signed by Christopher Lloyd. Uh, oh my Doc. God, that's awesome. amazing! That's amazing. So, anyways, all three of us, it's time to uh, fire up that flux capacitor, hop in the DeLorean, and we're going to head back to July of 1989. Will Clark is on the cover, and let's see. So, I was looking up Hank Aaron's rookie, and back in 1989, you could have gotten one that was in near mint condition uh, for $850. Which is uh, pretty. I mean, back then, eight hundred fifty was a lot of money, but still, that's uh, what. What's a near mint copy go for now? I twenty grand, thirty probably grand, at least. something like that. Fifty, hundred. I don't know. <laughs> like, what, what's, what, we, I don't have auction house comps in front of me right now, so yeah, you, a lot is the answer. Yeah, a lot yeah. Is the answer. So, uh, what's kind of interesting is so being that this was. July of 1989, and we were talking about Ken Griffey Jr. His 89 upper deck has up arrows at six dollars and fifty cents. So the summer of the they they were probably just released. So right. and and Lucky. then we have if you wanted to go to a baseball card show in Texas, and this is 1989, it's two day show, and you wanted to meet Lou Brock, uh, and or Whitey Ford, be prepared to pony up for an autograph of flats and balls. Five dollars for Lou Brock and seven dollars for Whitey Ford. I'm in. Okay. <laughs> Which, sorry, Mike, I just got this. All you need is one point twenty one gigawatts of electricity, and you can get there. That's all you need. <laughs> just uh, that's it. Let's see. This is on the back of that Beckett is the yes. Ernie Banks. On the on the back of the Beckett, we have Ernie Banks uh, with his nice fifty four tops card. All right, so we have uh, we have a we have some complaints here, and the reader's right. So we have rookie card ripoff. I recently joined a mail order rookie card club. I think Steve was part of that. Uh, <laughs> the company sent me eight cards from the 1986 top trade set, whose total value is fourteen dollars, but they charged me twenty ninety five plus shipping. The entire trade set sells for less than that. Thanks to Becky, I realized this ripoff and discontinued my membership. And uh, they responded, that's a pretty big profit margin. Readers, uh, be very careful with such clubs. If you're already a member, evaluate the investment selection they send you against the prices in our price guide accept the good deals but send back to the bad overvalued packages pretty crazy how you know people really put stock into the 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 values that beckett was putting out in the price guides like you know and it's funny because now it's all about mike what's the word that everybody uses now Comps? Yes, comps. Completed huh. listings on eBay because those are actual sold listings. And um, it's kind of like, I don't know, I feel like for the past 10 years, 15 years, even though Beckett does provide, you know, good services, that the, the, you have to throw the Beckett value out the window. You know, when somebody calls me up with a collection and they say, well, I have book value this, I'm looking to get this. I'm like, I... As they say, it is only a guide. <laughs> right. So... Here, you're right. Here we go. So, uh, so we had no Hall of Famers inducted this year for baseball, right? Correct. Yeah. So last year, um, last year was it Harold Baines got in last year, right? Or was that two years ago? It was the year before. 
Two years ago? Okay. So Harold Baines, Mr. Underrated. When I think of an underrated player, the first that comes to mind is Harold Baines. Even though he had his worst season in 1988, he's done it all. He hits for power, production, and average. It's hard to believe this three-time All-Star has never been on your cover and ridiculous that his rookie card is so cheap. Their response? Uh, There are many underrated players out there, such as Baines. Our mailbags are full of readers. Uh, letters on local favorites we created a new monthly feature a second look to recognize such stars and give our readers a second chance not to overlook their respective cards so even by 1989 he was only a three-time all-star and again nobody's favorite player except for that guy <laughs> so we have a a no sh- Koufax a no show in 67 concerning 1967 tops and Dodger pitcher Sandy Koufax he appears on three cards I know ERA pitching and strikeout leader cards in number 238 but why doesn't he have a player card for that year he deserved one for his 27 and 9 record in 317 strikeouts in 1966 um the response was uh, other readers have noticed this apparent discrepancy too tops produces players cards for the current year based not on what played last year but who they project will be active during the current year When Topps was designing their 1967 set, they knew Koufax's career was over. Sandy retired after 1966 season and decided not to produce a card for him. But since they had planned on producing leader cards anyway, they had to give Koufax credit where credit was obviously due. Uh, Similarly, Topps had plans to produce a player card for Steve Carlton in 1988, but Topps realized Carlton would not be on a major league roster for for 1988, so his card was pulled. Uh, Some 88 Topps card checklist. Uh, have Car- uh, Carlton? I didn't know that. Have Carlton listed in you know in the set for 1988? I think that's pretty cool. Just and the, then yeah, they missed a, they missed a year with him in uh, 1966. They went from 65 to 67 with Steve Carlton, but there's no 66. Sure. So the things you learn on this podcast. <laughs> Shut up. And, <laughs> so, um, anyways, listen. That wraps it up for today. Next week we have Mike Riccio coming on, who is. A has been a longtime show promoter, and he is going to give us a, a little peek behind the curtain of what it was like to run shows, like actually run shows back from 1987. Uh, and he, I think he finished his reign in 2007, so he had 20, 20 years there. And um, what's interesting about that is if you look at the the players and their piece counts. So like today, it's all about the piece counts and the menued out. Um, or the priced out menu. So, you know, jerseys will cost more, bats will cost more, flats and balls. Now they're now they're uh, charging more for rookie cards to be signed. He was doing shows where they were working on actual, like you got paid by the hour. And they try, and so they, so bef- it was before piece counts and they would actually cram like 500 photos in front of the guy to try to get them all signed in an hour. And if a guy started talking, to like say one of the other employees, the promoter would actually get mad. So we're gonna we're gonna get all into that messy uh, next week for sure. Mike, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, sorry to to pull you from it, um, but you know, but but we're good over here. Steve, thanks for coming on the show, and we are out of here. Absolutely, a sincere thank you to all the listeners out there. If you like the show, please like, share, and comment below. Subscribe and hit that notification bell so you will be notified when all of our new shows are uploaded. Click on the links below to join Mike and Lynn's Facebook page loaded with sports memorabilia content. Visit Mike's opening day break room to see tons of new products opened up daily that you can participate in. And lastly, visit our eBay store Cardcast to look for the newest auctions of sports cards and memorabilia uploaded weekly. And we're out.